all the attendees of the first international conference for smart agriculture, food, and environmental ICSAM 2020. In this opportunity, I would like also to express my sincere appreciation to all keynote speakers for their willingness to join this international conference. It is a great honor for us, Untimta as the host, to have you all here and can hardly wait for the valuable knowledge and insight we will want to listen. Broadly, I would thank all the ICSAF 2020 committee for their hard work and endless of effort in preparing this international seminar. Their initiative deserves to be appreciated. The first is always hard, hard to execute by their determination and good intention so as it can be done beautifully. Ladies and gentlemen, although this year's seminar feels completely different due to the current unprecedented situation, but the spirit remains the same. The spirit to disseminate the results of intensive and collaborative research with partners, colleagues, and other fellow researchers in order to bring synergy of research among industries, universities, farmers, government, and most importantly, all societies. I strongly believe that this seminar signifies our good intention to share knowledge for better innovation, to bring some ideas and solutions for COVID-19 impact. We acknowledge that this pandemic has tremendously impacted our sectors, not to mention food security. COVID-19 has affected food supply, food production, and food chain. Food association organization has warmed all countries in the world. Regarding the potential world food crisis due to this pandemic, Utilta as one of universities in Indonesia that is focused on food security has taken stand and play a role in such issue not only in the form of international conference, but also in the form of research, collaboration with stakeholders, community service, and many others. In order to promote food security in Indonesia, I am glad to see this international conference, one of our great works notably Center of Excellence for Food Security in, in Untirta in order to fulfill key performance indicator output. Ladies and gentlemen, this conference also signifies Untirta's contribution to Banten and Indonesia. As the leading state university in Banten province, Untirta consistently serves medium for development of agriculture, food, and environment. I hope through an inspiring lecture and discussion among participants will allow and provide all of you, all of you, with valuable insights and knowledge and networking with other researchers, colleagues, and exhibitors. Finally, on behalf of Universitas Sultan Agam Titayasa, by reciting Basmalah, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I officially declare to open the first annual international conference for smart agriculture, food, and environment, ICSAF 2020. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Can we give big applause for the speech of the rector?
Okay. Thank you very much indeed. So based on the rector speech, the conference officially open. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go to the next agenda. Pray as opening for the conference. The Honorable Ahmad Wildan Pratomo SPD, time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, let us bow our head for a moment. Pray to God Almighty so that our international conference can be precious to all of us. I will let this pray based on the teaching of Islam and those who are not Muslims, you are pleased to pray according to each of your beliefs. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Hamdan yuafi ni'ama wa yukafi u mazira. Ya Rabbana adaka alhamdulillah. Rabbana al-bagiri jalali wa jika al-karimi wa azimi sultanik. Allahumma inna nas'aluka salamatan fi al-deen. Wa afiatan fi al-jasad. Wa ziyadatan fi al-ilmi. Wa barakatan fi al-rizki. Wa tawbatan qabla al-maut. Wa rahmatan inda al-maut. Wa magfiratan ba'da al-maut. Allahumma gfir lana. وَلِوَالِدَيْنَا وَلِلْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمَاتِ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ الْأَحْيَاءِ مِنْهُمْ وَالْأَمْوَدِ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ سَمِيعٌ قَرِيبٌ مُجِيبُ الدَّعْوَاتِ يَا قَادِيَ الْهَاجَاتِ Dear God, today on Tuesday 15th of December 2020, in this beautiful place, we gather here to bring about an international conference. Amen. Please make this conference as a useful science assembly, as a medium of sharing useful ideas, knowledge, and experiences of scholars, researchers, and students of various disciplines. May the conference we organize today benefit to our lives, broaden our knowledge, shine our ideas, and lead us to be successful, productive person, which in turn will boost dignity of our nation. Dear God, guide and bless our hearts and our minds with the lights of your guidance. Impart your supreme wisdom upon our activities. Help us to speak our minds clearly. Help us to listen to each other, respect each other, love each other, so that we are in included to the blessed persons. Dear God, protect us from unintended temptation. Show us the right path and give us knowledge and strength Perform good things equally show us and make it clear the bad things and give us knowledge and strength to avoid them dear god you are the only one who can fulfill our prayers rabbana atina fid dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina azaban nar bi fadlika subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamu ala al mursalin walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin assalamu alaikum Thank you for the prayer, Bapak Ahmad Wildan Pratomo. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's go to the next agenda. The agenda is photo session. Please show up and show the video of your Zoom. Prepare for the photo session together. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Once more, slide one, slide two. One, two, three. Slide three. One, two, three. Okay, enough. I would like to address to the 
all keynote speakers and all invited speakers. And the agenda now is coffee break. Hopefully everybody have prepared for the snack in front of you. Can I, uh, can I ask the participant from Jember, what is the snack, uh, the special snack from Jember probably? Makanan khas dari daerah. Yeah, while waiting for the keynote speakers, uh, probably everybody knows about the special food from Banten, Sate Bandeng. Can you mention all special food from Banten? Besides nasi gonjleng, wow, this is very special from Cilegon, yeah, Bu Mutia, yeah. Nasi gondle. Yeah, probably the participant from out of Banten can see the special food from Banten. Uh, here is the video that you can watch. Oh, let me read the chat. A participant can write down on chat and let me read while waiting for the keynote speakers. The keynote speaker is ready. Now let's come to the next agenda. Hopefully everybody has finished uh, your snack time. And let's go to the next agenda. Keynote speaker panel session. The, this agenda will, will be led by Dr. Nani Mariani. Let me read the CV of Dr. Nani Mariani. Dr. Nani Mariani, uh, she was born in Tangrang, 29 July, 1983. She is a lecturer of biology, education, bi educational biology, uh, teacher training faculty of Universitas Sultan Ageng Tirtayasa. 
She is a researcher at Pusat Unggulan IPTEC, or Center of Excellence of Food Security and Patient, Universitas Ageng Tirtayasa. And her research interests are biology and biology education, mycology and microbiology, plant pathology and biotechnology, and its related area. She graduated from IPB Bogor, and she got master by, uh, in microbiology from IPB Bogor, and she also hold master in two research, microbiology, NASA Toulouse Francis, and she hold PhD or doctoral degree in phytopathology, Wageningen University, and research the Netherlands in 2018. Uh, she has very many, yeah? she has many publication in five years. And probably I cannot mention all of the publication, but you can check the her Google Scholar, uh, Dr. Nani Mariani. Um, and uh, uh, she also has ever got some grants from LPPM and from, uh, what is it? Research grant in 20. Uh, in food security and microbial community in rice resource spheres of Banten origin. So, not too much explanation about Dr. Nani Mariani. I believe uh, that you are really waiting for the keynote speaker session. Please give applause to Dr. Nani Mariani, MSG. Time is yours, Ibu. Hello, guys. Do I need to use microphone? Or? Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Bu Ais. I welcome you to the panel session, the first international conference on smart agriculture, food and environment, Center of Excellence for Food Security, Universitas Sultan Ageng Tirtayasa. Thank you for all of the speakers and participants who are joining us this morning. And my name is Nani, and I will chair this panel session. So today's keynote speakers, we have four experts in various fields related to the team of our conference. And this session, I will divide this panel into two parts. So two keynote speakers will give their talk and followed by the question and, question and answer session. And then the other two keynote presentation and then Q&A session. We want all of the participants benefiting our keynote speakers on their expertise. So please ask questions to our speakers. You can use rice hand icon in the uh, Zoom toolbar or write your question in the chat panel, then I will address your question in the Q&A session later. So each of the speaker will have 20 minute presentation. And this even also broadcast, broadcasting via YouTube Untirta TV. So I will also pick some question from there. Any question from our viewers? <laughs> now I want to introduce our first speaker. Apology in the uh, detailed program is actually Professor Narisawa who will speak first. And because of the technical issue, so I asked uh, Dr. Sam Susana to speak first. So I want to say hello to her. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Sam Susana. Assalamualaikum, hi. Do you How hear you? me? Good. Yeah. I'm good. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. What time is it in Kuala Lumpur now? You are in Kuala Lumpur or Putrajaya? Yeah, yeah. In between Kuala Lumpur and Putrajaya, very close. Uh, it's 10, 12 uh, in the morning. 10 a.m. in the morning over in here. Yeah. Yeah. So you can hear me clearly? Yeah, very clear. 
So now I want to introduce uh, short CVs, Dr. Sam Susana. Dr. Sam Susana Abdul Aziz, she is an associate professor at the Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, University Putra Malaysia. She received bachelor degree electrical engineering in 2002 from University Technology Malaysia. And after that, she continued her master study and her PhD study at the Agricultural Engineering at Iowa University USA. Her research area of interest are agricultural informatics and instrumentation, precision in agriculture. And today she will be sharing with us about artificial intelligence and machine learning for agricultural application. So you ready to share with us the your PowerPoint, Dr. Samsuzana? Okay. Okay, time is yours. Okay, uh, I hope everybody can uh, can see my slide. Can I can I start now? Yes. Um, thank you very much uh, to uh, respected chairperson, Dr. Nani Mariani, honorable guest, uh, director of University of Sultan Ageng, uh, Professor Dr. Fatah Sulaiman. Uh, all the keynote speakers and participants, a very good morning to everyone. My name is Sam Susana Abdul Aziz from the Smart Farming Technology Research Center, University of Putra, Malaysia. First of all, I would like to thank to University of Sultan Agam Tirta Yasa for, the, for organizing the first international conference for Smart Agricultural Food and Environmental IC SAVE especially to Pa Ali Mudin for inviting me to speak uh, for the conference today. Um, today, I am going to share our, my little work in collaboration with some local startup companies in Malaysia about utilizing artificial intelligence and machine learnings for agricultural applications. Logi umum, gitu ya. Uh, apa namanya? Uh, ternyata waktu yang kita lalui bersama kemarin itu enggak kerasa ya dari awal gitu ya, sampai I'm hearing some other voices right now. Uh, sorry for the interruption. Okay. All right, so my pre my presentation will consist of four topics, which are, uh, first, I would like to introduce what is artificial intelligence and machine learning. And then I will talk a little bit about the current state of the art of artificial intelligence. And then I will share, I will share with all of you some of our project related to artificial intelligence and machine learning with collaboration with the startup companies in Malaysia. And then also I will talk and discuss a little bit about the challenges and the future trends of the uh, topic. Okay, what is artificial intelligence and machine learning? Okay, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, is, is not new. AI is, uh, is the term that we have heard uh, for so long. Based on Oracle, any technique that enable computers to mimic human behavior can be called AI. Machine learning is actually a subset of AI and can be defined as AI techniques that give computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed to do so. So nowadays, the most advanced technique of machine learning is based on multi-layer neural network. 
and it is called deep learning. So deep learning is the recent advanced technique of machine learning that has been used widely worldwide in many applications, including in agriculture. So the current state of the art of the artificial intelligence, just like any other technology, artificial intelligence has gone through several state of ups and downs called AI winter. So in the history of artificial intelligence, an AI winter is a period of reduced funding and interest in artificial intelligence research, which was happened once in 1970s and another one in late 1990s. However, nowadays, uh, uh, based on an international services company called PwC, it is estimated that uh, AI will contribute about 16 trillion to the worldwide GDP by 2030. So we spend a significant portion of our everyday life interacting with smart system and AI is at the core of the system and it has been become an integral part of our modern lifestyle. So uh, AI and machine learning has changed the landscape of smart agriculture with the help of the enabling technologies such as Internet of Things and as the advancement of the IoT technology shifted from sensor-based IoT to visual IoT, the role of artificial intelligence and machine learning in agriculture become clearer as more complex data has to be processed and analyzed at a different level of computations and transmissions. As the result, agricultural technology has also emerged from able to solve a well-defined logical problem to solving a more complex fuzzy problems such as pest and disease recognitions and fruit quality inspections. So in our work at the Smart Farming Technology Research Center, University Putra, Malaysia, in collaboration with a startup, local startup company called Plants OS, we seek to empower farmers with data-driven insights through customizable IoT hardware connected to a platform and powered by the Google Cloud. As we all know, uh, Google Cloud is a cloud computing service that can be used to run the machine learning analysis for various applications, such as especially it is if the application involved with image or visual data, and that can also be used for agricultural applications. So uh, founded in 2016, Plant OS is based in Malaysia and Bahrain, consists of a global team members that aim to democratize digital agriculture by providing affordable technology to uplift revenue and improve operations, especially uh, focusing on urban farming. Their first commercial product was the automatic fertigation system to monitor temperature, pH, EC of fertigation nutrients and control the nutrient mixing process using an automatic dosing mechanism. Using this system, users can continuously looking at the trend of the parameters and take a necessary action if the value is out the targeted value. The auto dosing system is very handy because farmers do not have to conduct a manual nutrient mixing process to irrigate their farm. Okay, uh, I hope everyone uh, can can uh, hear me clearly. But if if you couldn't uh, clear, uh, well, if you couldn't hear me clearly, you can uh, always uh, uh, let me know, so I can repeat. Okay. Um. The, uh, the, their next product uh, of the company in Plant OS was focusing on utilizing image analysis and machine learning to monitor plant growth and disease detection. So farmers can take picture from a mobile app during their farm inspection and the data will be transmitted to the cloud where machine learning analysis will be conducted to determine the crop cycle. So this is one of the projects that we're working on, uh, on utilizing the uh, machine learning and AI for agricultural application with the company. You can, can uh, hear me clearly, but if, if you couldn't uh, clear, 
uh, well, if you couldn't hear me clearly, you can uh, always uh, uh, let me know so I can repeat. Okay. Shall I proceed? Okay. Um, on the same effort at. Testing one, two, three. Okay, on the same effort at University Putra Malaysia in collaboration with Malaysian Agricultural Research Institute, Mardi, we had developed a pilot study to utilize the deep learning techniques for insect pest recognition in the field. A total of 1,142 insect pests were labeled and for computing using Python as an object processor was used to pre-process the RGB insect pest image, including image resizing, labeling, and recording, and conversion. And then a pre-trained deep learning model called Faster Recurrent Convolution Neural Network, or we call it RCNN, was utilized under the TensorFlow framework at the processing center on the cloud. So the faster RCNN model was able to detect the insect pest, classify and count the pest population in the field with an accuracy around 93%. Um, and search recognition model can be exploited and as an AI-based application for farmers to identify fruits, vegetables or plant diseases based on image captured by their mobile devices. Okay, in their effort to help farmers leveraging latest technology in artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, the Plant OS works with local university like you, uh, like us, University of Malaysia, local urban farmers, and many technological companies to help them accelerate the development of their products. Uh, the next um, example that I would like to share with you is another collaboration that we have uh, been going through uh, that... Uh, Utilize the machine learning and artificial intelligence. That is the work with VC Agrotech, a startup company specializing in system development and integration for agricultural application. So the company started in 2011 with customized engineering solution based on specific and individual user requirement and specification. Then venture into agricultural solution um, in 2017. In our collaboration with VC Agrotech, we had an involved with the development of VC's O-Grade, um, where we developed a deep learning model with the company to classify the all palm fresh fruit bunches into different quality le level at the oil palm mill for automatic sorting of the fruit bunches. Uh, so this is an example of the semi-automatic sorting system that has already been used in the industry. However, it is still rely on human inspection uh, and it, it needs expert to sort the rec and recognize the quality of the fresh fruit bunches. So the current uh, all palm fresh fruit bunch grading is highly depending on, mon on manual observation, time consuming and labor intensive, and it is very in inefficient. So in this work, an optical-based imaging system was developed at the sorting conveyor to collect FFB images as the fruit travels on the conveyor in real time. I am going to show you a short video of how the system is working. So I hope everyone can see the videos. The video or without sound? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I think we we couldn't hear anything here. Okay, but but the video is moving, right? Yes. Ah, okay. yeah. Video, the video is moving, is it? Yeah. Now it has sounds, yeah. Basically, um, uh, the system that we developed to classify uh, different type of brightness of fr uh, fresh, all palm fresh fruit bunches. So in this uh, system, we use a deep convolutional network implemented using the TensorFlow framework at the processing center on the cloud. So in this model, the fresh fruit bunches can be classified into different ripeness of quality categories, which are empty bunch, unripe, super uh, overripe. And uh, the accuracy of the model that we develop uh, is approximately 80% uh, accuracy and is still in progress. Okay, uh, so the, the accuracy can be improved uh, when uh, we um, implement an, an object processor in the local uh, locally at the edge to process the image data more uh, intensively. Um, the image was subjected to noise such as very busy image background due to foreign object like soil dirt on the conveyor during data acquisition. That is the reason why we uh, only achieve approximately 80% accuracy but this can be improved as we uh, further improve our algorithm as well uh, as uh, the data acquisition system. Uh, so the end goals of the project are to improve the quality of the FFB received at the mills, to improve the quality of the Malaysian crude palm oil CPO, to improve the efficiency of the oil and canal extraction rates in the mill, and to receive a fair deals between supplier and millers during transaction. From our work, um, Okay, from our work, we recognize a few challenges that affected the practicality of the artificial intelligence and machine learning in real applications. So uh, we recognize that computation can be challenging with high noise agriculture data, such as data collected um, uh, at, in the harsh environment like moving conveyors. So these type of data are subjected to errors and noise during acquisition and transmission or complex field condition, which is require high level computational algorithms. So um, advanced data analytics algorithm to process large visual data at much faster rate are expected to boost the adoption of artificial uh, intelligence and machine learning in agriculture. We also recognize uh, that the, to develop a good machine learning model for industrial application, it requires huge data set to train the model and large data sets are very expensive. It is uh, required time and resources to collect the data set, especially for customized application like in agriculture. And usually agriculture tech startup will need to rely on external capital to gather data sets to work on the system they're trying to develop. And that is where we as the university and researchers can come to play to work together with them on acquiring public and private grants for research and data collection. So uh, we hope that as the price of technology become more economical, the adoption of such systems in the industry are starting to increase. I would like to end my presentation today by inviting everyone in this conference uh, to come join us to further discuss the future trends and technology in agricultural and food engineering by visiting uh, our conference uh, that is organized by my institutions, that is the International Conference of um, Agricultural and Food Engineering. And you can visit us at the website at www.kpi.upm.edu.my. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that will be the end of my presentation today. Thank you for listening.
the nice presentation, Dr. Sam Susana. So now, uh, in the beginning, uh, I told you that we will have two keynote speaker because of the technical meeting. Uh, we still waiting Professor Narizawa to join us. So is it okay, Dr. Sam Susana, if we open for the question and answer for your talk? Sure. Yeah, I'm. I'm here. And I'm ready. Okay. So now, uh, we can open for the question for all of the participants. Is there any question for Dr. Sam Susana? You can. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Um, can somebody help me? Who's speaking? <laughs> Uh, boleh saya bertanya? <laughs> oh ya, yeah. oke. Okay. Uh, okay. Please introduce yourself. Oke. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning everyone. My name is Muhtar. I'm very happy join this seminar. Ya, yeah, I have question for doctor. Doctor, you use uh, CNN, right? CNN uh, using modified or deep learning, okay, right? Yes. Okay, why uh, you have a classification, right? And then I have question, the first uh, you, which validation you use the first and why you know compare only, why uh, the second question is, why you only only one method, why not compare? Because if we compare, we can, Uh, we can compare the best uh, model, like the best method. Okay, thank you, doctor. This is my question. Okay, thank you, uh, Muhammad Mokhtar. Uh, oh, I, all right, thank you. Thank you, could doctor. You yes. your, could you repeat your first questions? What is what? Okay, doctor. Uh, which your validation model, validation model, right? You use classification, right? Classification, uh -huh. yeah, right. I, I, because you picture one, picture two, and output, right? This is, I think, you use classification, right? No regression, okay? Yeah, uh -huh. okay. Because I also, uh, in my research in machine learning, it's very interesting for me. I think, uh, I asked to uh, the validation model, the first, the first question, and the second, why you not compare, uh, on I. Uh, I'm sorry if I mistake. I, I think you only use uh, CNN, right? CNN yes. with modified. Yes. I think I think better you use to compare with uh, other methods. Thank you, doctor. Yes. yes. Yeah. My okay. question. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mohta. Um, I very appreciate your question. So basically, uh, it, it depends on uh, the project that we would like, would like to develop. Uh, if it is an academics project, it is very useful for you to compare different. Um, methods, uh, you know, to get an academic uh, uh, comparisons and you will know what is the best. Uh, as for developing a, a system for industrial applications, so we have a lot of limitations. So in this case, uh, uh, the company has set a few uh, target where we would like to just use the pre-trained model that is only that, that is already available. And that model, uh, the CNN model is, is, is Uh, is openly and is uh, uh, open source and is already there. So we don't want to to you know uh, start with something complicated. We just want to start with something simple that is already been there and test it whether it's okay or not. And then after that, we will figure out whether we would like to further improve the model with some other models, or we can just proceed with that one. Because the model that we use is uh, compatible with the Google uh, Cloud Platform that we use in our in our system. So uh, our system has certain requirements that, you know, that need to be met. So that's why we come up with the uh, current uh, fastest CNN to, for that model. So basically it's already there in the, in, in the, uh, TensorFlow platform, you can just use it. So, and so far from our tests, uh, the, the results are promising. So we don't want to, you know, further goes into other complicated uh, methods. But you are right, uh, for academic work, there are a lot of other methods that we can try and we can always uh, compare. And it's also always depends on the type of images and, you know, the type of uh, data source that you have. And we need to know what are the, most suitable for your type of data. So in this case, for our, our applications, it, it works uh, fine um, for, from our pilot test. And of course, for further uh, um, 
for the investigation, we can always uh, test other methods. Yeah, thank you very much for your suggestion. Thanks, Doctor. Welcome, Doctor. Yeah, I also have some other questions from the chat group. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, because I couldn't hear you like one minute. So like whether our connection bad or your connection. So you finished with answering the uh, Pak Mukhtar question? Yeah. Okay. Thank oh, you. So no. now I will, yeah. I will read for you the question from the chat room. Okay. We have question from Dianisa. So the question is, how could we apply all machine learning for agricultural application? when in our place, the technology itself still not support to do it? Okay, uh, well, that is, that is a very uh, challenging question. So if you don't have the facilities or the, you know, uh, technology to support, uh, that will be very challenging for you to, to uh, adopt the, the technologies. Um, but that's the point uh, that I'm, I'm trying to say, uh, like what I uh, talked to uh, Muhammad Mukhtar, that AI and machine learning is in, uh, there is a lot of open source, open source um, algorithm or, uh, you know, written program that available freely um, out there. So uh, we can start with the one that is available freely first and then explore with that one and then you can proceed with the more sophisticated one that, that has to be paid. Uh, so AI and machine learning is, 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 is mostly very reachable right now in, in, any, in, in many platforms. So uh, you just need to find the platform to, to get to, to use it. Uh, that's, that's what I'm, I, I think the answer. Okay, so uh, let me ask you. So this platform is like the available apps? Okay, so, so uh, in my case, uh, I'm utilizing a, a Google Cloud Platform. Mm -hmm. From the Google Cloud Platform, there is a lot of API, open source API that is available freely. For example, TensorFlow. Uh, and then uh, TensorFlow Platform is a platform for you to, you, to do your machine learning, you know, uh, uh, using an open source uh, source code, you can use it freely. Um, and of course, you also need to use the language that is uh, adaptable to the free uh, on uh, free uh, you know, uh, platform. So Python is one of the language that is compatible with a lot of uh, open source machine learning or AI platform. So we need to go through the open. Uh, um, my advice is to go for the open source free open source uh, platform first, and then uh, that is where you start. So basically, when you have the internet and you can like download access this open source, then you can do it in your field, right? Yes, 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 exactly. And I, um, internet is one of the main, um, well, main big backbone of everything. So if there's no internet, then that will be very hard for you to do it. Lah. But so you really uh, once you have, yeah, when you have access, uh, there's a lot of available open source. Um, source code and platform that you could, you can start utilize. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your answer. So the next question from uh, Dr. Yusrama. How we can distinguish the quality of the product by the image? And can we make a portable machine for application proposed by your method? Yeah, okay, that's a very good question. That is basically the end, uh, the end aim, the end goal that we want to, to do. So the, the machine learning should be able to, to be able to be installed in a uh, portable machine for you to, uh, to for you to help uh, in, in doing any, um, you know, um, applications. So yes, the answer is yes. You can, uh, there's a lot of method for you to, uh, at the end of the day, convert the, 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 the modeling into a portable system. Uh, that, that is basically why I work with the uh, startup company because they are system integrator. They are expert in integrating the system into, you know, the portable machine that can be used in industry. So yes, in the industry that, that is 
the method is uh, already well, well known and it can be converted into a portable machine. Sorry, you are muted, Dr. Nani. Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Okay. Okay. So I have my own question. I'm a plant pathologist, so I'm very interested when you talk about disease on plants. So yeah. you said your uh, uh, one of your platform can recognize this, right? A pest disease in my case that I showed you pest. is pest, yeah. Pest or, uh, or so only pest? Yeah, okay. So it's the, uh, because the machine learning platform that we will be using are the one that is available right now for open source, basically, uh, be, uh, if you are rely on the Google platform, mostly they are depending on image. All right. So if you have images, any type of images, if, so long you have an enough database of the images, you can always come up with a machine learning to learn about the images. So in my case that I that I uh, showed you an example, we collect an e images of the insect pests of the insect pass in the field. And then currently, if we see the in manual, uh, in manual approach, um, the agricultural officers, they also collect the images, but they count the image manually. You know, the, the, insect, pass is, the insect is very small and you, can, you have to look it under a microscope to recognize them, to recognize them into different type or categories. So they're doing it manually. So what I did is, okay, I told them that, okay, you don't have to do it manually. I can help you to just use machine learning to identify it for you. And it works. So that is basically what I, I did. So if you are a plant pathology, if you have a much more complicated images, which is very you know small, it still can be done so long you have an enough data that we can process and that images, you know, um, you can distinguish between different, you know, what uh, type that you want to, to recognize. And the machine learning will help you to, to learn and to recognize it and categorize it for you. Yeah, so I'm thinking because uh, uh, we are planning to the plants. So when your machine learning uh, based on the image, so I'm thinking maybe we can scan uh, yep. using our hand point yes and then uh, we, we can uh, identify whether this is from uh, bacterial wilt or fungal wilt and something sure. like that. yeah as long as your, your your plants showing different you know characteristic for different uh, impact then you can recognize it basically um, I have one PhD student is working on the same problem that you just mentioned so basically we we take images of the leaves of the plants that we planted. So we we monitor very closely the changes of the leaves. If the leaves have some, you know, uh, weird, uh, you know, a transformation throughout the growth, we can we can actually detect it and know what is the problem based on our information. So the machine can always be trained. Uh, by our, you know, we, we basically, uh, the no, the human knowledge, we can transfer to the machine algorithm so that they will learn from us. So that's basically the machine learning. So yes, it's basically very possible, Dr. Nani. Very interesting. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sam Susanna. So I think uh, we are now, uh, Professor Narisawa is joining us and we can, uh, we need to stop our uh, a uh, uh, question and answer session for your talk. Thank sure. you for your nice presentation and your answer. And I hope you will stay here. Sure, yeah. yeah. Okay, so now we are uh, moving to our next keynote speaker. I want to greet Professor Narisawa. Hello, good morning, Professor Narisawa. Hello. Oh, well, uh, I have to say, uh, firstly, uh, I'm very sorry. I made a mistake about the joining time. Um, I, 
Yeah, well, actually, we are uh, earlier than in the schedule. Oh, so it's not your fault. <laughs> okay. Okay. So okay. I think now in uh, so you're living in Ibaraki or in Tokyo? Yes. So no, already. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm in Ibaraki now, not Tokyo. So sh shall I say good afternoon or good morning? Well, good noon. Just just before lunch time. <laughs> okay. So everybody, now I want to introduce our second speaker, Professor Dr. Kazuhiko Narisawa. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your time and joining us this morning, Professor Narisawa. Short CV of Professor Narisawa, he is professor at the Department of Food and Life Sciences, College of Agriculture, Ibaraki University, Japan. He received his PhD at Tsukuba Graduate School, Division of Agriculture in 1993. Then he works as junior scientist at Plant Biotechnology Institute of Ibaraki. And then he went for postdoc, fellow at the University of Alberta at Moncton, Canada, 1999 to 2001. And after that, he returned to Ibaraki as research scientist. And now he is professor at College of Agriculture at Ibaraki University. His research interests are plant pathology, environmental and agricultural science and ecology. His expertise is isolation of soil fungi that can be used as biocontrol against plant pathogen. He authored more than 100 paper publication and thousands of citations for his papers. Today, he will talk about vaccinating plants using dark septat endophytic fungus and root associated microbial community to suppress disease plants. Professor Narisawa, are you ready with your slide PowerPoint to share with us? Okay, I will. Okay. Oh, well, uh, first way you need to uh, close the uh, share the, this PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well. sure. So it's okay. I I can't hear your voice, Doctor Nani. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can I start? Yes. Okay, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here in the uh, conference. Uh, well, uh, today's my topic is the, uh, here is a title, Establishment of Plant Vaccinating System by that uh, and by the franchise. Uh, well, uh, my research topic is related with the symbiosis, uh, plant and microbes. Uh, as we know, the, uh, recently, the uh, research uh, focused on the microbes really developed, especially uh, if I talk to the student, um, my body or you, we are not human being. I mean, uh, we are human being with microbes. So the, in the uh, microbes living inside of our body can control the, our future, like uh, uh, you know that uh, in, the, uh, in the same as the in the plant uh, we have that today's topic is kind of the uh, microbes living inside of plant. Uh, let me start about the uh, oh, well. So. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, uh, well, can you see the uh, screen? 
Okay, okay. It's amazing how many living things are in the soil. But I wonder, with science and technology so advanced these days, why do we know so little about soil organisms? Well, until recently, researching microbes living in soil required culturing them. But with current technology, scientists can only culture just 1% or less of soil microbes. Why is it so hard to culture them? Well, there are two reasons. One is that scientists don't fully understand what nutrients the microbes need in order to grow. The other reason is that the microbes are interdependent with other species in the same ecosystem. Isolating just one species to culture is not an effective method. It's complicated down in the soil. Along with microbes, there are larger creatures too, like woodlice and worms, and the root system of plants. It can't be easy to sort all that out. You're right. It is very complicated. But scientists have found clues to unlocking the many secrets of soil organisms. The key word is endophyte. The endo in endophyte means inside. The phyte means plant. Together, they form a word that means organisms that live inside a plant. Most endophytes are microbes. In fact, there is one type of endophyte found in roughly 80% of terrestrial plants. Mycorrhizal fungus, a microbe that is a symbiote of plants. That means they live together and help each other. Okay, uh, it's a nice movie. Uh, but the, uh, just the follow this movie. Well, no. Sorry, I have some problem about the... Uh, So uh, again, the okay, okay, it works. Okay, uh, well, usually we believe that this is plant, okay? But it's not true. Uh, plant always uh, associate with fungi like that. So that uh, we can't see any microbes on the plant, but the, even in the uh, leaf part like that, and then uh, stem part, and of course the root part, uh, leaving the microbes uh, with plant, okay? Especially the root part of the plant is very important because they uh, get their nutrient from the root via fungal hyphae. So we call, oh well, no. So we have, uh, I have a little bit problem about that PowerPoint. I don't know why. Anyway. Okay, uh, well, here is the uh, target of this today. If the uh, this type of the uh, microbes we call that septate and fight. So uh, they have a oh, sorry, I interrupt you. Yeah. We you need to share your slide. Did you? Yeah, you can't see. No, no we cannot no. see. <laughs> sorry. sorry, okay. Once again, I try to share this slide. I don't know why. Do you want us to help? Okay. okay. Yeah, we can see now. You can see? Yeah. How about this one? Okay. Oh, well, I'm sorry that we are getting to the, uh, it, this is the, uh, we call that septate and fight. They have a unique character, like a utilization of the organic nitrogen and also the uh, many researcher uh, interesting about that feature, they have a kind of the environmental stress tolerance to the plant. Well, no. 
I don't know why the uh, animation is not good. Sorry. Okay, uh, well, uh, I hope we, I will not have the, any uh, problem on this slide. Anyway, uh, the, uh, this fungi hold uh, some uh, unique characteristics, especially, uh, well, no, they cannot. You can see your PPT, it works. Can you see that? Yes, yes. It okay. works. Okay, thank you. Uh, they have a board, board host flanges. Is it okay? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, also, they have a hypho network like this and connect each other. I mean, the, even the uh, different uh, family of plants. Uh, they have, uh, uh, they hold the kind of the uh, networks they stop establish. And then uh, the uh, neighbors uh, help each other like that. Okay, again, the, uh, I will show you the other movie. Let's see how endophytes are being used to aid in agriculture. This is a farm owned by Ibaraki University. Kazuhiko Narisawa is researching how to harness endophytes for agriculture. This is soil that we took from a forest on the island of Yakushima. He treks all over Japan and occasionally abroad to collect soil samples in a quest for unknown endophytes. So far, he has isolated around 2,000 strains, which he keeps in a freezer. Of these, only 10 or so are known species. Most of these endophytes remain unnamed, their properties unknown. Narisawa is interested in the disease-preventing effects of endophytes. He has been experimenting on asparagus, a vegetable whose cultivation in Japan is rapidly expanding. When repeatedly cropped on the same plot, asparagus becomes susceptible to pathogenic soil bacteria. To combat this, Narisawa turned to an endophyte he collected in Canada. He planted asparagus shoots with and without the endophyte in soil harboring the pathogen and compared the results after one month. On the right is an asparagus plant with the endophyte. On the left, one without. The difference in the branches is obvious. The difference is even starker in the roots. The plant without the endophyte sickened and failed to send out roots. 
The plant with the endophyte did not sicken and has flourishing roots. Endophytes can deliver other benefits too, like resistance to environmental stress. For this experiment, Narisawa used sweet sorghum. This tropical crop is a source of biofuel, but it doesn't grow well if air temperature is low during sprouting. Narisawa tried raising sweet sorghum in conditions replicating early spring in his part of Japan. He tested 115 different strains of endophyte to determine which best supports sweet sorghum growth. Narisawa's research aims to use endophytes to make agricultural production possible, even in harsh environments. This would include places where the soil is at a low temperature or where the soil contains very few nutrients. His research is ongoing. Selective cultivation has long been used to improve plants, to make plants more resistant to disease, and to help them survive in tough environments. How do endophytes factor in? Endophytes do not actually prevent disease directly, but when they establish themselves in a plant, endophytes can switch on the plant's inherent resistance to pathogens, cold, and other adverse conditions. That's the mechanism. So endophytes enhance a plant's ability to protect itself. Right. Endophytes help plants help themselves. And we are still learning exactly how and why they work. In fact, it is believed that mycorrhizal symbiosis played a crucial role in the initial colonization of land by plants bringing life to Earth. For something so ancient, we are only just starting to learn the true potential of endophytes. We're studying how to use them to grow healthier plants, ones more resistant to diseases, pests, and harsh environments. This will help us grow better food, control soil erosion, and even make various medicines, just to name a few. Endophyte research is still just getting started. We can look forward to many discoveries ahead. We can. Wait, uh, well, the... Uh... He said that the uh, N5 uh, project just started. I uh, will explain about the uh, more detailed information about the N5 project ongoing. But again, the uh, slide is not work. I'm sorry. I, again, I tried to uh, list at the uh, slide. Did you did you uh, make your slide uh, slide show full? Oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay. It, yeah. It, I, it, yeah. I think that if you if you just make the normal view, it's fine. Okay. Okay. Don't uh, make well, full view. Okay. Uh, well, that uh, I uh, explained about the uh, more uh, practical usage for the uh, end fight. Uh, really, the I I suggest to make an agent of the end fight for application issue like a field test. I just combined with the uh, agent with soil, uh, nursery soil, and then sowing a seed of the target plant, like a tomato plant, and then at uh, automatically grown with end bite. End bite can infect the root fruit uh, uh, and the colonel. Well, uh, we call the uh, end bite plated plant. And after that, uh, in the case of the uh, test, uh, we try to the uh, ability for uh, preventing a disease like a fungal disease of tomato. Okay, and then here, here is the uh, result about the uh, NFI treatment effect on suppressing disease. This is controlled. You can see the uh, root first very clear, so you can find the uh, several. Uh, you know, dark colored root and that. And the fire treatment uh, looks very healthy and whitish. And then uh, this is severity here. It the uh, the end fight treatment can control the disease. Okay. So and uh, it's it's also uh, interesting the uh, result about we succeed to detect end fight how many percent of the end fight, the colonized root fruit. 
Okay. Uh, the before inoculation of the uh, target, the pathogen, and fight colonize the root part, only 3%. Okay. And the, after that, I mean, the uh, after uh, inoculation of the pathogen, and why the uh, constantly exist in root of the plant, uh, I mean, to make plant, but uh, that percentage of the end fight the uh, uh, 3%. And, but the end fight can protect the disease. I mean, end fight do not need the uh, uh, huge uh, area of the plant root. Only uh, 3% is the enough for preventing disease. But, and also we can succeed to detect the end fight using the molecular method, okay? Next slide. Okay. Next, the, uh, you can enjoy the uh, other movie. Uh, we found the more interesting. Oh, sorry. So, go ahead. Yeah. We 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 cannot hear you in the moment. For the moment, yeah. You cannot hear my voice. No, no. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, it's okay. Okay. Um, Okay, so that uh, you can enjoy the movie. The uh, the movie uh, also the tar target the uh, based on the uh, fungi. I mean the end of plus the micro. Okay. Look at this amazing image. It looks like art. Right. But actually, it's an image from Ibaraki University of a symbiotic micro. These vertical tube-like structures you see are filaments of fungus. The green dots inside are actually bacteria. Bacteria live inside a fungus? Right. Fungi need oxygen to live, but many kinds of bacteria can live without oxygen. And it turns out that this fungus is able to survive even in oxygen-deprived conditions as long as the right kinds of bacteria are present. And what benefit did the bacteria get? Well, the bacteria usually cannot grow in the presence of antibiotics. But the fungus is unaffected by antibiotics. So when the two are together, the fungus protects the bacteria. Both of them can survive. That's what makes a simple relationship. So both the bacteria and the fungus are helping each other. Right. Next, let's see how endophytes are being used to... Okay, uh, that uh, video said that uh, the fungi is not fungi anymore. Fungi living with bacteria, especially in the soil. Okay. Oh well. That uh, this is the uh, the end fight we call the uh, viral simplex. The the fungi. I mean this end fight originally from Yak Island in Japan. Well, uh, usually I ask to the audience the uh, Have you ever been to Japan? And also the Have you ever visit the Yak Island and uh, something like that. But, uh, well, it's very nice place, the a, a little bit southern part of Japan, and they have a hilly, the uh, really nice forest. Well, in this area, the, uh, it's very, really uh, nature-based, the uh, a little bit calm, uh, Implement and they probably we can get a uh, nice fight from that uh, that place. Okay. Anyway, uh, I am my, uh, well. Usually I culture the fungi like that, but sometimes happen that uh, bacteria appeared on the fungal colony like that. So we view it as the contaminant. But, Okay, it's not true. Here, here is the uh, example that here is hyphae, uh, invite fungi, hyphae, and here is bacteria. It looks like a very nice, uh, you know, that uh, looks like the uh, plant. So uh, we can detect how many uh, type of bacteria exist on the uh, fungal hyphae. We can succeed to us several different species exist on the fungal hyphae. And they are a little bit unique. Uh, uh, the fungi usually 
prefer the 23 degrees Celsius, but uh, even this fungi can survive under high temperature, uh, 37 degrees. But the bacterial population and what type of bacteria uh, exist on the fungal hyphae uh, uh, on high temperature condition, only rhizobium exists on the fungal hyphae. This is a very unique bacteria. As you know, this they contain about the uh, a symbiotic symbiosis with, with the uh, bean family or something like that. Okay, so uh, here is a test the, uh, by uh, uh, you know Rita Sam, Professor Rita. Uh, she invited me the, this day here conference. Anyway, uh, here is control of the Chinese cabbage under high temperature. Their growth is not good, but uh, if you carefully look at the, these three uh, endify treatment cabbage, this Chinese cabbage is very nice compared to the others. So, but these three uh, endify the same species. So, what difference of this only this one uh, hold the light beam? Okay, so that we be, we believe that now the this type of the uh, bacteria uh, collaborate with the N5, alter the uh, something like a stress tolerance to the plant. So this bacteria is the uh, key uh, for succeed to getting tolerance to the plant. Okay, uh, let me introduce about the uh, field test about the uh, disease protection. Uh, we are very lucky to succeed to protect the disease under field condition. This end fight treatment can protect the disease. Uh, protect value around 60% is very nice uh, compared to the other end fight and control. So we check the, uh, uh, what type of the microbes in, involved with end fight. So this is the fungi. Example, uh, here is the, uh, you know, the uh, circle, I uh, mean the uh, lithosphere of the plant, and then triangles show the uh, endosphere of the other uh, part. And uh, let, let is the uh, end of eye treatment, green show the control. Uh, sorry, that's it. Skip that, skip that. Mm -hmm. Same as the bacteria, uh, here is the uh, end of eye treatment, and here is control. Again, the end of eye treatment, and then control. And the uh, left side show the uh, 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 lithosphere. So this is lithosphere, this is end sphere. Left side end of eye treatment, right side control. Uh, what the difference between them? So. That uh, firstly, that same same plot uh, control here. The control uh, called the like that green, and then end fight treatment the uh, and here is the end sphere. Okay, uh, we can conclude about uh, from the uh, the end fight treatment after the other micro especially in light of the microbe, really influenced by the uh, treatment. We can check that the, what type of, type of the bacteria associated with the, uh, for successing, uh, preventing the disease of the, uh, in this case. Uh, as we know, the uh, dominant, the uh, very uh, famous the bacterial species for preventing disease. Uh, and treatment here uh, can attract about this type of the bacteria, especially in lysosphere. Okay, so that means the N5 can protect the disease. However, N5 plus effective bacteria can protect perfectly about that disease, even in field condition. So now we can detect about the uh, what type of the uh, 
plant and what are called the fungi involving in, in their nature. So their association can detect from that the uh, method. This is a kind of the example of the Holes site. So in the Holes site, here is A, including the endophyte, and this is their plant, okay? And also these are uh, companies about the uh, endophyte and the, uh, the plant. So in this whole ecosystem, endophyte is the core microbes. So we call this the endophyte uh, exists as core microbes. It's very important for establishing the ecosystem, even in the forest. Okay, so then, uh, so in the conclusion, I uh, can conclude about my research topic that uh, endophyte is very important for keeping health, uh, like a vaccination system for the plant. But endophyte also associate with other microbes, like a bacteria, uh, effective bacteria, like that. So. The uh, also the root fruit is more important than other part of the plant. Uh, here's the bacteria like that. So we uh, believe that this is the uh, plant. And also now we have a really interesting approach for the uh, more uh, you know the sophisticated the uh, idea uh, for future agriculture production system. We can detect. What type of the microbes are really important for keeping plant health like that? So if we found that like that, it's some kind of the uh, disease plant using the uh, the one system or something like that, we can spray the uh, effective microbe uh, with end bite with bacteria like that. We can uh, keep the uh, always the uh, plant are healthy. So uh, this is the uh, kind of the, our dream, but uh, this the uh, idea uh, uh, could accept it from the nature plant. Uh, our research group uh, will do uh, this kind of approach with the farmers and then especially the uh, organic farmers. They care about the uh, reduced chemical stuff, uh, and also producing healthy food. The uh, keyword is endophyte with micro. So this is the uh, last slide. I made a several the problem about that. Uh, uh, if you have some question, please really ask me that. That's all my talk. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Thank you for a nice presentation, Professor Narisawa. Oh, sorry. I, I, I'm in several problems that uh, it's a little bit difficult to, uh, you know, that understand about the, uh, my talk. But, but if you have some, okay, go ahead. Yeah. So now I will invite all the, of the participant to ask question. You can drop your question in the chat box. I will read for you, Professor. Or the participant can ask uh, by themselves question for you. So now I have one question in the chat box from Dr. Yusrama Deni. The question is, we have a soil problem here in our community that is nearby the industry. Have you investigated the soil and bacteria regarding the industry environment? Is it possible to make the soil fertile by simply put the bacteria in the soil? Okay, thank you uh, for the nice question. The, uh, it's, uh, it's available. Uh, and also the, we can detect about the uh, bacteria uh, and fungi also uh, from the soil. But, you know, the, uh, I, uh, 
I check the soil bacteria or uh, other microbes uh, in the uh, program soil. Uh, that that you know the microbe is not so important for supporting plant growth in soil. I mean, only in soil. Uh, we we uh, uh, we need to uh, detect about microbes from the lysosphere soil, I mean, the land the root. Okay, if we check the microbes around the root, it's very clear. So uh, we have uh, several results about what type of uh, microbes associate with uh, for supporting plant growth. So it's true, uh, it, it's possible, but please check the lysosphere soil that will be uh, just soil. Okay, we need uh, plant. We need plant root. I mean, is it okay? So thank you for the answer. Um, is there any question for the other participant? You can use rice hand icon in the Zoom. Okay, so maybe, so I will ask my own question. So this is very interesting, Professor Narisawa, because I also working with the plant pathogen Fusarium, and I, I saw in your slide that you you said that your endophyte can suppress the Fusarium uh, on tomato. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, so this is the daxeptat endophyte or just common endophyte? Okay, uh, well, just the, uh, I, the uh, accepted end fight. I didn't see any uh, common end fight. Okay, so from uh, so when you use your end of fight uh, on tomato, from which source you isolate your end of fight? Okay, uh, well, uh, there, uh, we have a several uh, effective the isolate of the end fight. I Accepted end fight, but especially one end fight uh, we called Velanopsis simplex. This is very unique isolate. Uh, we succeed to isolate the from Yak Island uh, and also uh, Ibaraki Prefecture to isolate from Japan and other one isolate from South Africa. Okay, three only three isolate exist in the world. That this uh, end fight, the uh, only uh, you know that it's very rare species. So if you try to isolate the end fight beyond the simplex from your country, this is fast record uh, in in world. I mean. So do you think if I apply this uh, end of ice Daxeptat endophytes to banana with fusarium, for example. Do you think it will work? I hope. So. Oh, I know. I, I understand about the banana is that fusarium disease really, uh, you know, severe disease in the world, in your area also. Yeah, because uh, so I'm working with the, I'm still working in how to control fusarium on banana. Mm -hmm. And now I'm thinking about using the endophyte. The problem is it's not really easy to find the accepted endophyte, right? Because. No, no, I, I think that you can, you can actually be uh, the accepted endophyte though, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Wilder, uh, uh, you know, very well about that. You can uh, collaborate with her. So. Uh, very easily you can get the uh, amplified from you, uh, you know, around your area. Okay, I will ask her. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll read from the chat box here from Dr. Rida. Mm -hmm. So the question related to it consortia of root endophytic fungi we apply many isolate of root endophytic fungi at the same time and how the effect for the plants is it also will give good plan well it is possible if we apply many isolate 
Oh, well, it's a very nice question. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, uh, it's a challenging area. You know, that uh, they they have a little bit the uh, competitive, the, uh, you know, mm, I think the, uh, it's possible, but we need to uh, separate about the portion of the route, like, uh, you know, uh, the timing. Firstly, uh, it's the kind of rapid growth and why can uh, infect the route first. Okay, okay, so that, then uh, some kind of the uh, resistant reaction will be occurred to the other uh, fungi, I mean, the slow growing fungi. So that means uh, it's really difficult to uh, collaborate each other. I mean, there are several different types of end fight exist same time on the root, in the root. It's a little bit difficult, but after that, uh, the some slow growing fungi try to infect other part of root, like a uh, uh, root chip, land root chip. So they are free for the other end fight so that uh, they can uh, exist, the uh, collaborate with each other. I think that the uh, timing and the birth of the root are very important for uh, coexist with different types of the end fight. It's a little bit challenging. So if you can succeed with the, this, the, uh, you know, a uh, finding, you will uh, be published to the uh, really nice paper, like Nature or something. Okay, thank you for your question. Thank you for your answer, Professor. So the but so far you you only use one species of the DSA, or you you did some of the uh, different species for the inoculation. Oh well, uh, I have uh, several different species of the end. I mean the DC, and uh, so depend on the plant species or situation of the. Uh, Problems like uh, uh, for today, I explained about the uh, control of the disease mainly, but other environmental factors like uh, hot temperature or low temperature or uh, like uh, uh, other uh, environmental factors involving to the uh, production of the agricultural product. So, uh, for example. Uh, the anopis simplex is very effective for preventing disease. And the other species, like uh, uh, PLC4 Fultinia, it the uh, other species of end fight, can alter the tolerance for the high temperature stress or uh, salinity stress or something like that. So we can uh, use the uh, several different types of end fight for different uh, purpose for uh, escaping from from the environmental stress. Is it okay? Yeah, thank you for your answer. You. Um, so I'm still waiting the question from the participant. Is there any question for Professor Narisawa? Please raise your hand. Okay, I think uh, I think that's the question that we have, Professor Narisawa. So thank you for your nice presentation and answer. Yeah. I think we can now move on to the next our keynote speaker. So again, thank you, Professor. Maybe we can uh, give big applause for Professor Narisawa. Thank you. Hope you can uh, still stay in this room. Okay, I will. Okay. So I saw the uh, Professor Nasser already joining us. So I want to greet him. 
Hello, Professor Nasser. Uh, hello, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, it's, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, I'm happy to be with you here today. Okay, thank you. So now I will introduce our third keynote speaker. Dr. Nidal Nasser. Short CV of Dr. Nidal Nasser. He is currently a professor of software engineering in the College of Engineering at Al Faisal University, Saudi Arabia. His education background, he received his bachelor and master degree with honors in computer engineering from Kuwait University in 1996 and 1999. He completed his PhD in the School of Computing at Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario, Canada in 2004. And between 2014 and 2017, he was the Dean for College Engineering Al Faisal University. He is now the founder and director of the Internet of Things Research Lab, Al Faisal University. He has authored more than 190 journal publications and have given keynote speeches and tutorial in major international conferences. So today he will talk about intelligent technologies for monitoring crops in greenhouses, application and challenges. So Professor Nasser, are you ready with your slide? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so time is yours. Okay, so I can share now? Yes. So okay, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, perfect. So we'll just go to the slideshow and then we start. <clears throat> All right, so again, like uh, good morning, everybody, and I'm um, uh, happy here uh, to be here, like with you uh, this morning, with a different maybe uh, topic or view, uh, talking about how we can uh, utilize uh, technologies. And uh, specifically, I'm talking about the intelligent technologies these days on uh, monitoring uh, groups and uh, greenhouses. Uh, I will go through the framework that I'm still working on. Uh, this is a big project that I'm working on. And uh, this is, will be covered through the presentation, my presentation. And uh, first I will start talking about the uh, like uh, motivation uh, behind the work that we are doing. And then we uh, draw some research questions. And based on this, we start to thinking how we can the prompting technologies can be uh, used in terms of solving this research questions. Uh, I will uh, focus on part of the solution because as I mentioned, it's uh, like a, a big uh, uh, framework that it has uh, three different phases. We are on phase two now. And then I will share like uh, some promising results that we received them so far. And we will, at the end, I will conclude and give some research direction for this specific part. So uh, if I will start talking about the, uh, uh, the uh, from ag agriculture part of view, we focus on a specific part of the agriculture, which is what's inside a greenhouse. And uh, this is our, my focus is more on a data that I collected from Ontario, Canada, and the British Columbia, Canada too. So uh, this is why I will mention more about the, like uh, the Canadian data that I have uh, collect them and uh, do the analysis or the solution. Uh, so if I will go, what we mean or how we define the greenhouse, like for our research, it's more a structure that with the walls and roof made uh, like more transparent material of a glass, and which will allow like a more uh, light sunlight to come inside the uh, like a greenhouse. These uh, structure range in uh, size from small uh, sheds to industrial uh, size buildings even. And the interior of a greenhouse exposed to sunlight become like significantly warm 
uh, than the external temperature. So it means there are a kind of change of environment inside the greenhouse. This could be like from in terms of the uh, temperature itself or even uh, through the wind from the outside uh, itself. Uh, <clears throat> In, uh, in Ontario, like uh, it's found out there is like uh, in the specific area of Ontario, which is the, the Limington, uh, there are a largest con concentration of vegetable greenhouses in the uh, North America. This is, will uh, give us like an indicator of a kind of production of the a plant in agriculture. This is we need to keep an eye on and keep it like high at every time. At the same time, we want to think about how we can reduce the uh, cost of everything related to any solution in the uh, agriculture. I will share with you here some uh, statistics where like uh, according to the uh, Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Food, in the last decade, uh, the production of uh, plant agriculture in greenhouses has been increased. And this is, it's very obvious on the, uh, like, uh, if you, uh, between like uh, uh, the, and the figure that I provided here, let me maybe use the laser pointer here, yeah, I can. Yeah, where we have like uh, from 2011 up to 2019, and you can see like in the different types of greenhouses that it's become like increased. Uh, this is, it's a given opportunity for more employing, uh, employ employment opportunities. And at the same time, this will give us some signal that there is a labor that this will make cost us 30%. And this is something that we needed also to uh, consider in our solutions or not. So do we need this like 30% of the green expenses to be spent on the labor? Or we may have a different way on automated our like uh, a greenhouse uh, uh, production itself. Oh, sorry, I use the laser, it seems. Uh, yeah. So uh, in order to uh, maintain uh, this level of a uh, production, uh, there are a lot of attempts, uh, research attempts that it will uh, try to focus on how we can harvest the fruit and vegetable. I know some solutions even in British Columbia, uh, Canada, they start to use the robots to do the harvesting. So this is one solution, like uh, protect the plants by early detection and prevention of disease. How we can like uh, protect the plants uh, by just detection, the, uh, any types of the disease that, or, or even kind of controlling the best itself. Uh, maintaining the crops, like uh, when is the good time to water? Uh, uh, is it this is a good amount of watering for the uh, type of the plants and so on? All these types of like uh, 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 these types of like uh, 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 approaches or a different method that is to try to keep the production high in the greenhouses, uh, and this is will be like the concepts that applied or like on different. Uh, let's remove this. So uh, this is will like applied on any different stages. Uh, this is including the uh, germination uh, uh, or sprouting or flowering and the fruit uh, development. Uh, however, like uh, with this such like uh, environment, uh, the development of a plant is directly will be impacted by its environment factors around it. Uh, so a greenhouse like will environment itself, it consists of uh, different factors. This is including the air temperature, humidity, air pressure, dew point, and the wind itself. Uh, so uh, I just, I will give you just an, an example where we can think about like uh, uh, the effect of the microclimate and the crew. If the humidity, for example, that it increases to 99%, uh, as a result of this, this is may generate what we call the, the white fungal or the powdery mildew like uh, fungal that will start to grow over the leaves. And this is a big risk where if it's spread it over the whole greenhouse, it means we are losing the whole group itself. So the point here, how can I just protect and detect early 
the point here AI need to detect early the the uh, the kind of any types of diseases that may affect the planets. Uh, in my uh, focus here, I will uh, out of this uh, like motivations, uh, like we start us and is either like we interview some farmers from who has uh, like a kind of uh, a greenhouses to operate. Uh, some of them it's personal, some of them also commercial. And it's in different areas, some on the west of Canada, which is in British Columbia, and some the, are almost on the uh, center, uh, not center, the, sorry, the east part, uh, east uh, uh, part of the Canada and Ontario. And we start to ask a question like uh, uh, out of the interviews and the motivation that I just uh, talked about, uh, uh, how we can monitor the gro uh, growth in the whole greenhouse uh, area. Sometimes, as I mentioned, it's a small a greenhouse, but the other time it's a, like a big, like buildings, especially for the industry like purposes. And then another way, it, if there is any way that we can, uh, in advance, that we can predict the environment factors inside the greenhouse, because if we able to uh, 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 predict these factors, this will give me like more stability, I can have more control on the environment itself. Uh, other than uh, this, uh, another question that we uh, start to ask, like uh, how can come up with an automated system that can be uh, operating uh, like and detect early existence of a plant uh, diseases, uh, such as the powdery uh, mildew, uh, in a, a greenhouse where it could be like highly so depleted like and high depleted and decluttered. And at the same time, I just will want to keep uh, like in our uh, mind that if it's automated system, uh, then this is will not, we don't need the human interaction. And this is very important, especially like in our like uh, situation here, like the pandemic uh, situation, the COVID-19, that we need such a system. We need that it's, we have an automated system in a greenhouse that need less interaction from a human. And at the same time, the production is still at the same level of, for the groups and the same healthy plants that we have it, uh, growing in the greenhouse itself. We start thinking, and based on my research, like I'm doing more in uh, technologies, uh, like I'm uh, experts more on various uh, networks and uh, communication systems, and uh, start thinking about like what are technologies nowadays where I'm working on. I will introduce you to some technologies that it is, are promising, and uh, we start thinking about to build the solutions to answer these research questions. Internet of Things, it's a, like a, a promising technology and it's uh, highly now used in uh, different sectors uh, and agriculture and uh, health and uh, education and uh, uh, transportation. It's uh, like a, a promising technology. The concepts of the Internet of Things that we have a kind of devices or in general, we call them just some objects that we will be distributed in a different like places could be randomly or could be like a plan that based on a grid, for example, or a clustering or something. It's uh, depend on the application you want. These uh, will be able to sense, sense a kind of like whatever events that we want to monitor on that specific like area. The, these uh, like events will be communicated with a specific central base station where we will have all the data will be collected and will be or will be forwarded to the base station and will be forwarded through the internet to a user. The user here could be like a computer that I'm sitting in front of. I have all the data, I start analyze the data. These data could be visualized. I can visualize the data and be able to understand what events are happening on this area? What are the conditions? Let's assume I need you just to uh, monitor the temperature uh, every day or every hour or every minute. It depends, I can decide about this inside the greenhouse. So I just uh, uh, put some types of different types of sensors or if I'm talking about temperature, it means temperature sensor that will generate for me like uh, uh, data uh, about uh, according to the schedule that I planned for. 
Another uh, promising uh, technology also, which is almost uh, uh, in the same concepts of the Internet of Things, but here we are using cameras. And this is why I just call it for this, it's wireless visual sensor uh, networks. And as you can see here, it's a different like cameras. Uh, and what's nice here, which is less cost because there is no, uh, even less cost in terms of uh, uh, in maintenance because they will communicate wirelessly. So we don't need any types of uh, cabling uh, or power that we needed like uh, to uh, provide to these uh, like uh, types of the camera. Again, the whole idea here, uh, it, can we use uh, this technology, which is can capture images through the cameras, and then uh, these images can be analyzed somehow by some different like also, uh, for example, image processing methods, which I will talk briefly about it uh, next. And then this is, will allow me to early detect if there is any disease inside the, uh, the, uh, the, the network itself or not. The same concepts again, all the data, which is more here, we are talking about images captured by the cameras will be forwarded to the base station through a different types of communication protocol that can be used. And then this is to the application user where to start to analyze and visualize the data that it's arrived there. <clears throat> yeah, there are also technologies which is under what we call the, the artificial intelligence. Like we create or we can develop a kind of a programs that will allow me to uh, let this program act as a, 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 human, a, a, a human in terms of learning and reasoning. So it can give a decision. It means this program, if I give some input, be able to give a smart decision, a decision here. How we can implement these artificial intelligence uh, methods? There are two different sub direct uh, sub categories, uh, sorry, under the artificial intelligence. One it's called the machine learning and the other one is the deep learning. Machine learning, deep learning is a subset of the machine learning, but I briefly, I can introduce you to this that I have a lot of data and I will learn from this data. And we call that this is the history, the history of the data. So based on the history of the data, then I can predict what will be the future. This is very, very important like in any environment. It's not only in a greenhouse, but we apply this in a specifically like in a greenhouse where we be able to detect early if there is a kind of any kind of fungus on the leaves itself or not. This is the like main idea that behind what we are uh, presenting here. So uh, based on this, we start thinking now, we have the uh, farmers or even whoever operating the greenhouses, they need their production to keep it high at the same time with a low cost. And uh, we want to avoid any kind of or early detection uh, of uh, preventing any type of diseases that may affect the growth of the uh, plants inside the greenhouses. So uh, with all the research question, which I just mentioned before, uh, keep it in mind and how we ought to, uh, automate also the system itself, that it's with the less interaction from a human inside the greenhouse we come up with uh, utilizing these technologies. We come up with a framework, the framework itself, it uh, consists of uh, three different phases. And uh, in the phase one where we uh, utilize more the wireless visual sensor networks, where we'll be able to capture the image of a plant from different angles, different height also, like uh, this is to uh, make sure that we are covering the whole area of the greenhouse. The phase two, they stick the, the, we, we consider this captured image and we apply a kind of image processing technique and method. And we use machine learning to detect, is it, there is a kind of fungus or no. The third part of this, which is still on the progress work and the progress now, uh, how I have a data about the uh, temperatures. I have a, a history of temperature, humidity, for a specific like uh, a greenhouse in British Columbia in Canada. So how can I predict what's the future? What's the future of the temperature? And if the temperature, if it's become like high, what should I do as an act? This is the kind of like work what we are doing. 
in this talk, I can't like explain everything like uh, due to the time uh, constraint that I have it, but I will focus more on the uh, second phase where it's more like uh, we use most of the uh, technologies. I just mentioned them. And I will start by talking about the, uh, the a problem that we start defining uh, in that specific phase. We want to design and develop an auto automated a detection system. And once we say automated, it means a human interaction will be almost zero in this case. And this is very important in our like current pandemic COVID-19. And uh, to observe and monitor also diseases based on the presenting like on the leaves or uh, of the plants on an occluded and a cluster uh, greenhouse. Our focus will be like more on uh, tomato like uh, groups where we collect the data from different uh, uh, or from specific uh, greenhouse in uh, British Columbia. Uh, we propose uh, to for the, to solve this research problem, we propose the following uh, framework. And this is our automated uh, like uh, system as a solution. And the system is implemented in different uh, blocks. Uh, where we have IoT like Unity, or where we have the sensors, like sensors, or we call it also actuator. Like the sensor, something that it can sense, the actuator, something that can do action. For example, if the temperature is high, it's good to, to, in a fan, like inside the greenhouse, I can turn on the fan. This is the actuator in this case. So the idea here that uh, the system starts with the, like having the visual, wireless visual sensor network uh, unit where it starts to capture the image. Uh, this is, will be passed to another unit, which is the image processing. The image processing will allow me to identify the, what we call the, the region of interest. I need only to focus on the leaves. I don't need the background, for example. I don't need the soil. I'm not interested. I'm interested from the images on the a plant. Our focus on the leaves of the plants uh, during its uh, uh, one of the stages of the a growth. Uh, then we will uh, pass these uh, clear or pre uh, prepared images, we call them prepared images, to a machine learning detection unit where we apply specific algorithm and method that it's called the whole force machine al algorithm to start detecting. Do we have fungus? We don't have fungus. This is the question. If we have a fungus, then it means what we need to do. So it means maybe the humidity is high. So in this case, we will send some uh, like uh, kind of uh, command that, that uh, for the uh, wireless visual sensor network to take more photos to make sure. And at the same time, the wireless visual sensor network will send the IoT unit a kind of co uh, uh, commands that, uh, okay, increase or open the ventilation system or increase uh, or open any types of the fan of system to reduce the uh, humidity. These types of like what we are aiming and what we actually implemented so far. So uh, in terms of like uh, the image processing, we, as I mentioned on the first year, or the, if I go back to uh, here, the visual, uh, wireless visual sensor will capture the images. And uh, again, like when we capture the images, this is depend like on uh, our schedule, we can schedule this, but always we try to reduce the number of times that we capture the images. Uh, because again, like we are dealing with a type of uh, sensor uh, devices that may be limited in terms of the power and the processing itself. So preparing the images uh, here that it will go through a different uh, image processing method starting that we have the original image. If you can see here, like on the uh, photo on the right side that we have the image leaves are uh, clear. And on the back, we can see the soil, which is with a brown color. We want to end up that because we, our goal is not to focus or mix between the soil and the leaves. So our focus, we use the processing images uh, to convert it with different like method that is converted starting from finding the like uh, three basic components of the color red, the green and the blue, and then determine the difference between the uh, red and the uh, green, convert the images to grayscale. Once we are on a grayscale, it will be easier even to work because it's reduced like the 
uh, complexity or uh, in terms of the uh, number of pixels that we needed with the images. And then we uh, create a kind of a mask uh, that it will remove any noise uh, that's included in the image. And we focus at the end on the, uh, what we call the region of interest. As you can see, I need you to compare this one, the first original images with the last one, which is the uh, region uh, of uh, uh, interest uh, image, where we can, it's very obvious that no more we can determine or even be able to see the soil. It's only the leaves now. So now the images are ready to be uh, passed to the machine learning uh, algorithm where we'll be able to detect on each leaves if there is a kind of a fungus or no. So uh, the, I will spend some time maybe on the uh, machine learning here where we have uh, uh, two phases and the all prepared images uh, will be input to a machine learning detection using the whole forest algorithm. This is the one we are using. On the whole forest algorithm, uh, let me just uh, uh, present all these slides and uh, sorry. Yeah, so uh, and the uh, uh, like uh, uh, in the whole forest it's implemented in two phases. The first phase it's for uh, uh, focus on a training. And again, like a training, what it means here on machine that yeah. we have collected yeah. images and we, yeah. we want to. Okay, okay, Panis, yeah. Sorry. Ah, okay. So uh, we have a kind of a history, out of the history images, we try to predict now if there is a fungus or not. This is the answer machine learning will uh, uh, like uh, give us for a uh, gift for us. Uh, detection of fungus or no detection of fungus. So we create what we call the uh, positive and the positive, it means half fungus or negative, it means a clean, no fungus. Data sets, this is the data sets that we prepared for the training. And then we create what we call the, the batches. And these patches actually uh, come from the data set we just created from the previous like data set that it has the positive and negative. And th then we start to create the random forest. This is the apply of the algorithm itself, the ha uh, whole forest algorithm itself. The tree start with a node where here we have the node, it's uh, the tree and having the patches and split depending on the feature the patch carry. Every split will add more information to the uh, to the tree itself. Uh, next phase, as you see, like here. Uh, sorry, uh, I will just uh, show. Yeah, on the next phase itself here, uh, uh, this is uh, the whole forest testing. Now we are testing. Uh, we train, we get an idea like from the history itself on how we can get a positive as a fungus or negative, no fungus. We consider moving on the second phase, uh, sorry, the, the uh, Windows batch on the test image. The batch from the test image itself uh, will go through the trained random forest. Since every leaf node in the tree itself have the positions and the class information about the batch, then it creates a vote into a whole, uh, what we call the whole space. And the highest number of votes indicate there is a correct uh, location. This is the location of a fungus. This is the brief, like I'm not going in the details of like how we uh, discuss the like whole forest itself, but I'm trying to show the high level of the algorithm on how we can implement it. Uh, to be able to uh, 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 evaluate our like a proposed automated system, we start thinking about uh, an, uh, a, a kind of experimental, we have to run some types of experiments. And we start with the experiment setup where we have like uh, consider like camera sensor modes are distributed in the greenhouses in a different like uh, uh, ways that we, uh, uh, consider there is no overlap. It means one camera can only cover one area and it's not overlap with the it's like whatever on the uh, left or right side of the uh, camera. 
We use the sensor camera with uh, 12 uh, megapixels uh, of as a resolution. And the distance between, we test like uh, the distance between the camera and the plants. Uh, remember, this is early stages of the growth of the plants itself, uh, 30 to 40 centimeters. And the data that we collected, I can talk more about the data here, like uh, it's collected from, uh, it's around 282 images. And this is from Surrey, a greenhouse in British Columbia, Canada. And uh, the images is taken from different direction, different viewing angles. Uh, based on this also, we, this is, I can give the systematic like uh, uh, setup for the greenhouse where we have a kind of the uh, camera here. We have a type different types of sensors, for example, soil sensor, temperature sensor, uh, different, and also like a kind of a fan as an actuator that we may need it. And the type of what we call the, the gateway where we, the, uh, every sensors or even the camera sensor can communicate through this gateway with any types of the, the base station that we have. The next, uh, I will present uh, like uh, the more on the experiment results. We start thinking about the data sets to be divided into two or three different groups. A training to understand the history of the like or develop our model based on the uh, training and then start the testing and then the validation. It's, this is how we are like accurate in our like a uh, uh, method that we are applying. And uh, uh, one of the like interesting, uh, once we deal with artificial intelligence or machine learning or deep learning, it's good to always have a kind of what we call the, the uh, validation for our work itself. So we use a kind of what we call the five-fold cross -valid validation. And this is, we divide a hundred like images the, like in two different five uh, folds. And we like from the figure, I can tell that they are almost achieving the same like uh, results. At the end, we are interesting on what we call the, the uh, uh, area under the curve actually of the uh, receiver operating characteristics. And we achieved the average of 99.96% uh, as like a very, this is give me indicator that my, my work or machine learning using machine learning algorithm, it was a successful. The other interesting like results is now, uh, because you know, sometimes we may have on the leaves itself, it's not a uh, fungus, it's a, maybe a drop of water. So how we, or any types of like, or even like insects could be like on the leaves itself. How we want to make sure that this is like accurate or not accurate. In this case, we, uh, again, like uh, when we detect fungus, uh, this is, we call it the positive, no fungus, it means this is the negative. This is why we have a kind of like uh, uh, results, we call it the true positive and uh, uh, false positive. Uh, true positive, it means it's, yes, our system detects there is a fungus, 71%. And the false positive, it means it was not able to detect that it's a fungus. There is a fungus, but was not able to detect. And this is only 1%. And the true, like, uh, uh, sorry, on the false uh, negative itself on detection here, that it's uh, uh, show that it's, uh, uh, the, there is like a, a kind, something on the, uh, on the, on the plant, but it found out that this is, not a fungus, it's a drop of water. Uh, true negative, it was, uh, it means that it's, we be able to detect that there is a fungus on the a plant, uh, but uh, with the even like, uh, sorry, there is no fungus on the plant itself. And this is giving me like a 23. So in a brief, the total of all positive detection, which is means that uh, the, we have a true positive, true negative. This is, will give me 94% out of as a result. Uh, and this is, we consider it like an acceptable and high even rate for uh, the testing itself. And the rate of false uh, negative was low as 5%, as I mentioned, and the rate false positive much lower up to 1%. Uh, percent. <laughs> And this is like uh, give you like more uh, here. Like if I will say like the uh, proof negative twenty three, 
if you look carefully, there is no fungus. So 23% that we be able just to say that there is no fungus. 71% there's fungus and we be, we be, were be able to say that yes, this is, there is fungus. So 71% there. If I will uh, check the false uh, negative, what it means, it shows that there is fungus, but was not able to determine there is a fungus, which is give me like only 5%. On the other, like false positive, which is it shows that the drop of war, uh, water and the leaf, as you can see, that is detected to be as a fungus. So this is, we called it the false positive. The uh, other like interesting also some statistic, usually once we work with machine learning and deep learning, there are some statistical results that we can get out. I will not go through all these, but if I will focus on sensitivity here, that is shows that the probability that our test results that uh, are positive when fungus is present, and in our case, we, we have the like high probability that 93.4, which is very promising. The specificity, again, like a kind of like show the probability that our test results uh, are negative when fungus is not present. And this is like in our like case also, we have a high uh, probability that it's reached up to 95.8. Other than that, it's like more statistical results related to the uh, concepts of once we use the machine learning and the uh, uh, deep learning. Uh, we we are not like only do the validation and using for example for but also we benchmark with other work we try to compare with our work so we try with the authors in the like reference 20 this is a, like a paper we just submitted to one of the conferences and it's mentioned that it's and they're like testing they the image they take it from the top of view. And this is, will be minimize, of course, the concepts of cluttering of the, on the plant of the itself. And the texture rate, it was only 70%. The other one, that it's another reference by the, uh, like, uh, Zihang, uh, group the leaf images before applying the color uh, texture detection. And this is, will reduce the clutter of background images, but the detection rate was not promising, which is the uh, 67 to 88%. Uh, it's improved uh, from the previous like work uh, done by uh, Bill Zocchi. And, uh, but uh, in our case that we reach up to using the whole forest, which is the machine learning, this is the first time was to be used in this uh, like area of the field that it's we use up to 94% uh, detection rate, which is we consider it like this is a very successful comparing to other work that we have it. Uh, I, will, I will include my talk and uh, like, uh, and uh, just what I want to point out here that it's very important now, given that the important, uh, like the, rapid increase on greenhouses, maybe my focus was on statistics on Canada, but I believe it's everywhere, everywhere that it's especially like on the cold, uh, like uh, countries that uh, cold areas that they want always to keep that as much as they the possible, like from the uh, greenhouses uh, projects. And they want to make sure that it's early detection and for any types of diseases that will help to maintain the always the groups healthy and also make the profit out of the greenhouses to be stable and more. Uh, so automated like a plant disease detection in, in, uh, in an environment that is not like a stable, it's always changed. There are a lot of factors that affect this environment itself. So this is make it also a kind of motivation to work more on the uh, involve the technologies and solving uh, research questions. The other like uh, also like uh, we uh, just as a conclusion, our whole force machine learning uh, found to be able to detect the powdery mildew like fungus and images of leaves and uh, taking from a wireless visual sensor networks and detection rate was very promising comparing to other, which is we, we achieve up to 94%. Uh, 
and uh, maintaining a low false positive, which is it was around 5% here, is very important for a successful of detection system as uh, each positive detection would require sending messages. Like uh, if there is any like false detection, it means they will send a message. This message is a waste overhead on the uh, communication of the system itself. I still uh, work on a progress, but I will uh, want uh, to share with you some research direction regarding to what I just explained. Maybe we our focus it's uh, only on a specific uh, group and the greenhouse, but it could be like generalized, and it could be like uh, and also like on uh, detecting the fungus, uh, powdery mildew like fungus, but it could be like uh, generalized to recognize any types of diseases and any. Groups. Also, we consider not only to have like uh, the camera as a static effects uh, camera, but we can have it as a mobile. And this is will allow like more uh, reducing the number of communication or recapturing the image itself. Uh, it could be like mobile on the uh, on the ceiling of the um, like any structure that we can come up with on the ceiling of the uh, of the uh, greenhouse itself. Um, also, we can think about uh, uh, collecting data. We already are working on that. We have a lot of data from the British Columbia Surrey greenhouse about the environment uh, conditions, like in terms of temperature, humidity, and the other uh, five environments which I mentioned. And uh, we are trying now using the deep learning, one of deep learning, which is based on a time uh, series uh, like uh, concepts, that uh, how we can predict the future inside the greenhouse. So we always, we try to make it stable and controlled in terms of the environmental conditions. By this, I would like uh, uh, to thank you again. And it was my pleasure to be here and share my like work with you. And I hope you find it useful. I'm happy here to receive any questions. for Professor Nidal Nasser after the last keynote speaker. So now we will, we will move on to, the, to our last keynote speakers. Oh. Professor, yes. So Professor, we will have a question and answer session for you after the last keynote, okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. So now I would like to introduce you our last keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Mutia SAMP. She is Professor Management Science, Faculty of Agriculture, Universitas Sultan Ageng Tirtayasa. She is currently the Director of Center Excellence for Food Security, Pusat Ketahanan Pangan Inovasi Pangan Lokal, Pui PT Untirta. Her education background, Bachelor Management Science, Universitas Siah Kuala, Master Degree in Architectural Agriculture Social Economic Universitas Pajajaran, and PhD in Management Science, Universitas Diponegoro, Indonesia. Besides her activity as lecturer at Untirta, she is also an active entrepreneurship motivator and work with small and middle enterprises. So today she will talk about tourist behavior and purchase intention toward local food culinary banten. So Professor Mutia, are you ready? Um, operator, please help to share PPT Professor Mutia. Banis, okay. So, Professor Mutia, time is yours. Oke okay, baik, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning. I would like to say thank you for coming to our international conference. It's a great to see you all. I am glad to see you all. In this presentation, we will discuss about Center of Excellence Food for uh, Center of Excellence for Food Security 
Local Food Innovation Universitas Sultan Ageng Tirtayasa and we will a presentation about research tourist behavior and purchase intention toward a local food culinary in uh, Banten. Okay, next. Uh, this is a vision and mission of IC40, a vision the, to become a center for the development of science, technology, and human resource to release a multidiscipline research based food security in uh, 2025. Mission to create a science technology campus based on multidiscipline to support the improvement of human resource, talk education, training, and community service in the field of food security. To organize training and dissemination of research finding on food security to mobile synergy and ancient national and international corporation network to achieve food security. Next, okay. Uh, this is uh, IC40 profile, the roadmap of a uh, master plan uh, in our research. The roadmap of research conduct by Untirta is a uh, focus on file of uh, food security, education, and culture, technology, and human rights, and democracy, sociopolitics, and economic. Uh, a center of excellence for food security was established in uh, 2018 to manage research on food security. Okay, next. Uh, Banten uh, this is uh, Banten has the potential for fisheries, plantation, and agriculture, uh, and tourism. Here is in the development uh, roadmap IC40. Next. Okay, development uh, plan and roadmap of IC40 Science Techno Campus. The first strength of research on food security, grant on research on food security, publication uh, support, and uh, seminar support, conference support. And two, the uh, institutional strength, preparation of the roadmap, inbound mobility, website development, research collaboration. And third, overseas non-degree training, a domestic non-degree training, doctoral study abroad, uh, facility, integrated laboratory of food security, provision of food security research tool, new campus, and experimental garden and greenhouse. Next. Okay. Uh, this is a fishbone, our research. Uh, consists of availability, access, utilization, and stabilization. The term uh, reset for all multidiscipline, uh, for all multidiscipline, uh, from engineering, education, uh, business, law, agriculture, medicine, and other. Next. This is the one. A product from our center of excellence that is uh, 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 milk fish satay. Uh, fish has a very good nutritional content for economy. For uh, next, next, this is a low economic uh, uh, fish process. Uh, in highly nutritious food. Next. The second product uh, from our uh, center of excellence, that is uh, talas beneng or uh, giant taru. Uh, this is uh, from Banten. Uh, talas beneng that is big. 
uh, and yellow. Nah, beneng taro proses into macaroni, noodle, nugget, cake, bread, and others. Okay, next. The third product from our that is uh, palm sugar. Palm sugar or brown sugar. Next. Next. This is a, the third product from our center of excellence. Uh, palm sugar is processed into palm sugar and uh, ginger. This is a very good for consumption during COVID. Our product brand is Sipaloka, which stands for uh, Inovasi Pangan Lokal. Okay, next. Next. I will present uh, I will present my research in the title tourist behavior and purchase intention toward local food culinary in Banten. Uh, most of Banten area has beach uh, tourists. Next slide. Next slide, okay. Okay, introduction. A Banten province, a strategic area for the ownership of the tourism sector. Jakarta and Banten distance only two hours. Banten province is one of the most attractive province in, in Indonesia as a tourist destination, considering there are more than uh 500 attraction in various part of the regency and city one of the most famous beach and destination for tourist destination in anyer beach okay next banten province consists of pandeglang lebak tangerang tangerang city silegon city serang city and south tangerang city its region has their own characteristic of natural and artificial culture, tourism, resource, and traditional living culture that have developed as national and even international tourist destinations such as Pesona Pantai Anyer, Carita, Tanjung Lesung Beach, uh, Marine Tourism on the Umang Island, Ujung Kulon National Park, Banten Lama, religious uh, tourism, and the uniqueness of the Baduy traditional community. The uniqueness of the Baduy trip is still natural culture and untouched by technology. Next. Okay. Uh, this is potential tourism location in Banten, Indonesia. Uh, 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 um, uh, next, Umang Island. Uh, this is uh, Anyer, Carita, and other. Uh, okay, next. Based on distribution of tourism tips in Banten Province, tourism attraction uh, are dominated by coastal tourism, religious tourism, and culture tourism. Coastal tourism cover almost all area in the Banten region. Religious tourism include Banten Lama Mosque and culture tourism in located in Lebak Regency in Baduy Trip. Uh, both the inner Baduy and outer Baduy. Okay, next. Development of small medium enterprise will support the development of the tourism business sector since the tourism sector is one of the good market for trading of small medium enterprise product, especially based on agribusiness with the provider of local food, culinary, and souvenir. Okay, next. Reason and object reason, the potency from small medium enterprise in local food culinary has not been developed as it expected. There are 
many problem faced by small medium enterprise with special in local food culinary, such as market access, marketing chain, business network, weak bargaining power, and lack of market information. Next. Okay, discuss. Indonesia has a variety of culinary culture. This is mega biodiversity uh, local food of Indonesia. Its region uh, has its own culinary uh, specialty. Indonesia culinary rich is seasoning. A spicy are uh, very beneficial for health. Of, uh, for example, Padang culinary, Aceh culinary, Sunda, Palembang, uh, Makassar, and the other area. Okay, next. Uh, this is a uh, local food culinary in Banten. This is kue pasung. This cake is served on holidays such as wedding, the prophet birthday, eighth, uh, and other holiday. This cake is famous in Pandeglang, Serang, Cilegon, and Lebak. Next. Uh, uh, rabek. Nah, this is rabek. Rabek is a typical dish of the Sultan. Uh, Sultan Hasanuddin of Banten made from goat or buffalo, meat with a distinctive uh, uh, savory and sweet aroma that is served on special days. Okay, next. Uh, this is uh, a local food culinary, gram asem, made from duck, meat uh, or meat, with a sauce, spicy and savory taste, it can be found at typical Banten culinary restaurant. Okay, next. Sate Bandeng. Sate Bandeng is uh, very famous in Banten. Milk fest sate, first ever in Serang in uh, 16th century, the king would let the kingdom want to eat milk, uh, milk fish with Chief took the initiative to crush to the fish flesh and pull out the bones and tone. The milk fish flesh in uh, uh, the flesh is smooth. The chef make a dish uh, by mixing the meat with spicy and then sticking the dog of the bamboo. That the dog is roast until cooked. Okay, next. Lemang. Huh. Lemang is one of the local wisdom in Banten, especially South Banten. Lemang is made from sticky rice and coconut milk that is put into bamboo and baked. Lemang is widely sold during the fasting month. Okay, next. Uh, nasi bakar sumsum, -sum, the, the, uh, the origin of marurus rice. Uh, as a typical food in Serang took place in 1941. At that time, animal butcher carried the remaining bones and uh, father took the mix with rice and spicy, then roast. Okay, next. Potential of uh, Serang Regency. Serang Regency has a great potential to be a famous area due to its uh, tourism attraction, such as Anyer and Charita Beach. Serang Regency also has a great potential of local food product. Geographically, uh, Serang Regency has a great mountain and beach that can be developed as a beautiful and famous tourism sport. Furthermore, in addition to emptying a milk fish, uh, sate, seaweed treatment, fishery, and other food industry can also be developed in Serang Regency. This is a uh, satay bandeng at uh, the Krakatau Mountain. Okay, next. Next. This is a potential of Lebak Regency, palm sugar. Next. 
potensial of pandeglang regensi uh, the chip uh, apa melinju melinju next potensial of silicon city uh, next uh, oke okay. study finding customer attitude had a positive effect uh, on purchase intention for local food culinary indicator use explorial intention uh, the indicator interest in seeking information and attention referential in, uh, intention interest recommended and provide information transactional intention interest and purchase and preference preferential intention have a willingness to consume and sensory judgment the second the subjective norm of customer must be improved to increase customer purchase intention for local food culinary in Banten province the third perceived behavior uh, behavior control had a significant positive effect on purchase intention okay next Local food is traditional food produced from an area consisting of various kind of processed food, both staple food and supplementary food. Local food reflect the characteristic on area. The availability of local food culinary that are used as souvenir by tourism also need to be considered. Local food product found at Anyer, Labuan, tourism attraction include meal fish, um, Uh, cake, uh, kue pasung, ceplis, gipang, uh, and, and the others. Okay, next. Conclusion. The study finding are very useful for small medium enterprise to development their product and for local government in planning development Banten tourism attraction and development of local small medium enterprise product in supporting the tourism sector. The role of the government in farming cluster will accelerate the process of small medium enterprise development. The study finding can be used as a, a preliminary date for uh, further studies, uh, whether quantitative studies and those involve the governance for the realization uh, process. This is a good opportunity to develop a small medium enterprise with trade of local food culinary so that it needs guidance by various parties, especially the government as a policy maker. Okay? Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for a nice presentation, Professor Mutia. So now I would like to invite all of the participants for asking question to Prof. Mutia and Prof. Nasser. Question from participants. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum, Bu Nani. Uh, I have question for Prof. Uh, Nidal, right? Prof. Nidal, are you here? Assalamualaikum, Prof. Nidal. Uh, yes, I'm here. Oh, okay, Prof. I have question, Prof. What's different? Uh, Assalamualaikum, Prof. I'm Mutar, Prof. <laughs> Waalaikumsalam. Nice meeting uh, okay, you. Prof. Yes, thank you, Prof. Prof, I have question, Prof. What's different? How uh, forest and random forest, right? This is method, right? Okay. The true. The first. Okay. The second question. Uh, what's limitation, Prof? Uh, I, I also, my research in conducting in random forest, I also to deploy. I want to deploy the random forest to bet to better uh, improve for accuracy, right? This is so many. I think because uh, random forest is the latest method. Um, maybe the latest method we can deploy. The, the 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 question is, what is limitation, prop? The random forest and the house uh, forest, right? And then the third is, I think is my suggest, I think we can make hybrid uh, model uh, like genetic algorithm for random forest and others because we can uh, to, we have to, to 
to improve for accuracy, Prof. Thank you very much, Prof. Yeah, just can you repeat the first one because oh, okay, I okay, Prof. Take, yeah. The first question: What's different? Uh, Hodge and random forest, Prof. The algorithm. What's the different, Prof? The difference between whole uh, forest and random. Random forest, Prof. Yeah, between Hodge and random forest. The different, Prof. What's yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the uh, the first, uh, like I will answer your first question, which is the difference between uh, the random whole forest and the whole forest itself, right? This right. is your question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, the uh, the uh, they are all almost the same structure, where it's based on the trees, but uh, the uh, whole uh, forest is more structured than the random because random it will be like uh, going through different paths, yeah, randomly. And start to select the votes and at the end back tracking. This is what we call it the recursive resolution. Yeah. For the uh, whole forest nodes, determined like where the exact path to go to the left, to go to the right and so on. This is like any brief, like what's the differences there. Uh, but in terms I can share with you like later, maybe through an email or something, the uh, some okay. application which can show you like uh, two different. Uh, uh, and the, uh, for the, uh, the second the question. What's the limitation drop uh, in random yeah, forest? Yeah, the limitation, forest. the yes, limitation okay. it's the scalability. Oh, so right. sometimes we cannot uh, like scale with the random forest. Like uh, so, what's limit us? It's the number of features we are using in our solution. This will uh, the scalability. It's the limitations. Uh, the third question, which is about the hybrid. Yes, I agree with you. And even like I have uh, one uh, part of the work that we are working. We are working on a hybrid like solution where we integrate uh, a deep learning with a machine learning algorithm together in order to develop like a kind of the uh, solution that we needed for the prediction of the environmental factors. Okay, okay. thank you so much, Prof. Thank you so much. Ah, most welcome. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Vamos a estar. So we have to I have a question. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. A nice talk. I'm interested about the topic. Okay. One question, actually. Uh, can we? Um, yeah, just a go here. Yeah. I, I think you may use only one of the uh, oh, to right. listen or to yeah. So Maybe I just type. I just type in the chat box. Uh, I can't hear very well. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Hello, professor. Yeah, yeah, now it's better. Okay, good. Okay, uh, one question actually, Professor. Uh, can we embed the system to check a possible disease of the tomato plant and treat it automatically with the system? And could you tell me about how to do that with your system? I mean, sometimes we need to uh, detect the disease of the tomato plants by system. Can you do it in your system or? Is there the yeah, actually, the, the work I already uh, talk about it, that's implemented and in the real like greenhouse. And it's a prototype, it's not like a, a big greenhouse, but just a small like a greenhouse that we, uh, where we, uh, the automation of the system has come that uh, by using the technology itself. Because again, like uh, how I can uh, know about the uh, the condition of the plants inside the greenhouse, I need a kind of camera that can sense and uh, like capture images, and these images should be like transmitted to a specific central unit we call it. So this is wirelessly. So this is why we use what we call it the wireless visual sensor networks. This is the implementation of the network itself. Now, once it's received these images, it, ne it needs now 
We don't need as a human to sit and see the images. We need an algorithm that it is smart. This is why I refer to using the artificial intelligence. One domain of the artificial intelligence, it's machine learning. So machine learning will be able to detect this is a fungus. And if there is a fungus, it means we'll give now an order. This is a kind of like um, in terms of technology, I'm talking that we send a message, for example, alert message. Uh, alert message could be to the operator to know there is a problem. Another alert message could be to another device, which is, as I mentioned, let's assume that the uh, temperature is high. So we can send a message uh, uh, to a fan uh, or any ventilation system inside the greenhouse to start working. Once it starts working, it means this is will reduce the temperature itself. As you can tell, like from this scenario, just I'm sharing with you as a simple scenario, that uh, this is there is no human interaction so far. This is why we called it automated system. And automated system, the percentage of like uh, we have to keep automated system should be reliable. So it means it should be like uh, also consider that there is no or we reduce the error on the decisions. This is why we uh, try to use the most uh, like uh, powerful like uh, in detecting the uh, like uh, we call it the borders actually of the fungus or something, which is the whole forest. Uh, it's show us the results that we receive it. It's a promising with the validation of the five across validation, we received 96.96% uh, which is a promising like uh, uh, detection rate, uh, even 94%. So this is a promising that we can uh, rely and depend on the system itself to be automated. So again, like if you want to do the implementation, we need kits, like a, a kind of sensors, a kind of like a, also communication, like a gateways, what we called it. Uh, connected to specific like base station could be Wi-Fi has a hotspot like uh, that can be and then at the end it's connected to a computer the computer where we implement the kind of the uh, algorithm that it's how for us or others if I want to use other that can analyze the data that's captured and give a decision okay. I will be happy like if you need any help with this later on we can talk about it in details offline. I, I will put my email after just we finish the, uh, so can you can communicate with me on, uh, anybody can communicate with me through the email uh, for uh, more details. Thank you, Pak Yusrama. Thank you, Prof. Nasser. So I will read for you, Professor Nasser, the question from the chat box from Bapak Ahmad Nurakin Putra. So the question for you, a large-scale agricultural production in the greenhouse needs an alarm system to warn the farmer if such undesired condition happens. So have you investigated the alarm system based on plant physiological status? Uh, is it like uh, the question here? Yeah, the question is uh, from the chat box. Uh, by who, sorry? Ahmad Nurakin Putra. Putra. Yeah, uh, if we are talking, uh, maybe I cannot find the, but it's fine uh, that uh, the alarm system I'm trying to. Have you investigated the alarm system based on plant physiological status in the greenhouse? Uh, yes, uh, but uh, if we are talking about the alarm system, like uh, that it's ring. Uh, this is not the aim, actually, of the work. Uh, yeah? The aim that how we can yeah, alert, but not uh, produce the sound, because there's no like a hazard here that is uh, make it uh, like a, a very critical situation. Unless if it's a kind of, it, if the, uh, the, uh, the question is more about if, say, like they, we have a fire then how we can like uh, uh, having the alert yeah, um, uh, uh, system itself to ring, for example, a bell or something. But our goal in our work, it's uh, still like uh, this is yes, we can. It's very easy actually to be implemented in our system. 
for example, let's say that uh, how we can make sure that we detect any type of fire, like uh, there is a high, uh, this is again the sensor, the sensor will start sensing uh, the temperature sensor, will reach a high temperature. Once we reach a high temperature, it means there is yes, a hazard here. And there is an important like uh, attention needed from the farmer or the operator of the uh, greenhouse. So in this case, yeah, it could be a ring bell or could be like even sending a message to a mobile, could be sending an email uh, to uh, uh, authorities uh, like or any like um, uh, like ringing a, a, like a phone call, emergency phone call for any department like fire station or something that it has a problem. Even with this sending the message, we can be able to send the uh, coordinates, the location of the greenhouse itself. Can we uh, uh, can we detect? Can we detect, for example, in the greenhouse, in tomato greenhouse, can we detect that this uh, tomato is uh, almost uh, harvesting time, for example? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, by using again, like uh, uh, this is a, again, this is what was actually it's an uh, the starting a project uh, where we start thinking about how we can use the robots because now uh, this is a, again like a, it's a kind of a collaboration project with the University of Guelph where I used to work there in Canada, uh, where we can use the robot uh, to know, like robot will not know like it's a time for harvesting or not. So the robot will pass. Once it see the, uh, the tomatoes tripe or uh, fresh that I can harvest it, this is using image processing techniques. So based on image processing techniques that can be able the robots like to harvest or not. So we can tell from the color, degree of the colors, if it's ready or not to be harvesting. Uh, the most challenge that we faced on this project was actually, uh, what about if the tomato itself, it's behind the leaf? In this case, it's hard actually to tell the robot if it's ripe or not ripe. Yeah. yeah. So the question for Indonesian context will be, so in Indonesia, we rarely use greenhouse uh, with that type of that type of high tech technology for uh, farmers. We use greenhouse only for experiment in the lab in a small scale. So, is it possible to apply this technology for or simplify this technology for farmers? Uh, yes, actually, I will tell you something. Uh, our system will work perfect in small greenhouses because still there are a lot of, uh, uh, we need more uh, advances in the technology to uh, make it more scalable. Otherwise I have to duplicate the network. It means uh, this is will uh, reduce, uh, introduce like more uh, communication overhead through the network itself. But in terms of non-greenhouse, yes, still this work can be done. Uh, but in this case, for example, I may not be interested on the temperature because it's outside, it's depend. But at this time, I will be interested on the soil condition. I can sense the soil condition and based on this, I can tell this is need more water, for example. So as I can start watering this, uh, the watering system based on the need like for the soil itself. Yeah, this is a very simple, like, yeah, this is, will be adapted, but only like a different type of uh, sensor devices that can be used for the outside or outdoor, like agriculture solutions. Okay, thank you for your answer, Professor Nasser. So because of the time, I will pick one question for Professor Mutia from the chat box. Sure. So the question is regarding Banten local food, all the time, people outside Banten always connecting Banten culinary with Sate Bandeng. While based on your presentation, there are many other culinary exists. Yeah, I also, I saw some of the food that I never taste. <laughs> I need to try. <laughs> so, so far, is there any effect, Professor Mutia, to introduce other local food to be notized for all? Okay, thank you, Miss Rida Octavia. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I uh, you 
Lulus emas uh, Promotion Exhibition uh, Local Exhibition uh, National Exhibition uh, We work together with the Tourism Office Small Medium Enterprise Office Department of Agriculture and others We did the triple helix model That is collaboration between academici, uh, business or industry, and government. Academici, academics, a rule for innovation, uh, technology, research, and development. And government, rule for regulation, policy, finan financing support. Uh, The role of the business or industry, small medium or small medium enterprise, is to produce produce a product to sell the uh, public. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Prof. Tia for the answer. And I think if you have uh more question on all of our keynote speaker you can address the question by sending them email and i think they will be happy to answer your your uh question all of the email of our keynote speaker will be uh you can you can read it in the book of abstract so i think and here professor ridal nasir sending uh his email address in the chat box so i think i will end this session I want to thank all of the speaker and participants in this panel session, and I hope you enjoy this session, advance your knowledge and benefiting from uh, all of the keynote speakers. And I will end to thank you for everybody. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, do you enjoy all the material from the keynote speakers? Yeah. Okay, uh, there is an emoticon of clapping. Probably you can click the clapping emoticon in the Zoom. Means that all of you give appreciation for all of the keynote speakers. Thank you very much indeed, all the keynote speakers. Hopefully, every participants get very beneficial information from all keynote speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, time to have a break for lunch. And please, before leaving the Zoom, you can try to rename the participant name based on room in parallel or panel session in the after lunch. Okay, make sure that all participants have joined the conference Zoom at 12.45 p.m. And we start the invited speakers panel session at 13 p.m. And have, have a nice lunch and see you at 12.45 p.m. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Bye, Kiki.